Good morning. Today is Monday, April 15th, 2024. Shivas yamim so'ar la bavatechem. For seven days, the holiday of Pesach, outside of Israel, it's eight days. There should be no leavened food in your home. Anyone who eats chametz on Pesach, it is a very serious punishment of kares, being, God forbid, spiritually cut off from the Jewish people. You should not eat any chametz anywhere in your living places. Rather, you should have matzah instead of chametz. Eating chametz on Pesach is the most serious eating sin, dietary sin with the most serious punishment of any other dietary rule. And our sages explain that it's not only eating chametz that we're not allowed to do. The Torah says there is also the prohibition of bal yira, bal yimatze. I'm not allowed to have it in my possession, in my ownership. Whether I can see it or even if I cannot see it, I'm not allowed to own chametz during that time. That means, for example... Even if I've done everything correctly up until the beginning of the holiday, let's say during the holiday, during Pesach, a delivery comes to the door and it contains chametz. Let's say I ordered something and it was late and whatever reason, and now they're coming to the door. I have to refuse to accept it because whatever I did to get rid of my chametz was before Pesach. Now somebody's bringing something new. It's not covered by whatever else I did. And the moment that I accept that package in my hand or even on my property, I have violated this prohibition. So a person has to say, I'm very sorry. Uh, It's because of a Jewish holiday. I'm not allowed to accept the package. And I will ask you, please take the package back to your own warehouse and I'll arrange to get it after the holiday. Or... Even if a neighbor ordered a package and it's delivered, and now it's not yours, and now it doesn't matter if the neighbor is Jewish or non-Jewish, and your neighbor wants you to take it in, let's say they're out of town, they want you to take it in and hold it for them until they get home. You're not allowed to do that either, because when I hold something for you to watch it for you, it becomes a picadon. It's as if you put it into my possession to take care of it. And I have a certain level of responsibility for it. For example, if I would uh, eat it myself, that would be stealing. And if I would be negligent and leave it outside and not take it in, it would be negligent. I would be responsible for it. So that level of responsibility means in a certain sense it belongs to me for that purpose. So I have to be careful not only not to accept a package for me, but not to accept a package for somebody else. I remember many, many years ago in our neighborhood, the, a company decided to do a, an advertising campaign, which under ordinary circumstances would have been uh, an okay gesture. And the advertising cam- campaign was done by Kellogg Cereal. And what they did was, on the first morning of Pesach, I'm assuming they didn't know, on the first morning of Pesach, they took a, a mini box of Kellogg Cereal with a little uh, um, flyer that says, enjoy our new cereals. And they put it on every single door knob in the neighborhood, most of whom were Jewish. And it was a big, big problem. It was a big Shiloh. You're allowed to open the door. Can you touch it? Do you have to leave it up? Oh, so got to be careful. The simplest way to fulfill this requirement, to not, not only not eat, but not own any chametz, is to give it away. Is to give it away. Either preferably to someone who needs it. So we operate every year, and this year is the same, we operate a food bank where the food is going to go to a non-Jewish organization, uh, um, NDG Soup Kitchen, and um, whatever extra food you have, 
that's chametz, bring it to a daf, and it won't belong to you, and it's going to go to non-Jewish people in need. That's the best thing to do. Already by the time of the Talmud, almost 2,000 years ago, the Talmud raises the possibility, what about selling it? Can I sell my chametz? And again, here, what we're talking about is an outright permanent sale. So I have, let's just say, a bottle of whiskey. And I go to a non-Jewish friend. I say, the whiskey's worth, in the store, it's unopened. In the store, it sells for $50. I'll sell it for you for $50. He says, yes. He gives me the $50. He takes the whiskey home, and he does with it whatever he wants. So Bays Hill says that that's fine. That's fine, because when I sell something, it no longer belongs to me. However, let's just look at the conditions. Base Hill is talking about where it is a permanent soul sale. It will never be reversed. It is an ir- right, never be reversed. It's not like I'm going to go back to him and buy it back. I'm selling it to him. I'm never going to have any contact with it again. And the chametz goes with the non-Jewish person in his hand, in his possession. So that's like a regular sale. That's a, that's a complete sale. Base Hill says that that's fine. And that's clear cut. But from that beginning, there has been a long evolution in Jewish law to get to our practice. And our practice of selling chametz is different in several different ways. First of all, we sell our chametz to a non-Jewish person, but we have an understanding that after Pesach, we're going to get it back. So that seems like a problem. Number two, the way that we sell our chametz, the chametz stays in our home. We don't actually lift up and and hand the chametz to the non-Jew. It's in our home. Yes, in designated places. But What kind of a sale is it if it's still in my home? And number three, we don't go through the exact valuation of each product. When you sell your chametz, you don't come with a list of, I have a bottle of this and the value is here, and I have a box of this and the value is here. So if we're not even coming up with an accurate value, how could the sale possibly possibly be valid. And lastly, the way that we arrange it is you do not do the sale at all. The sale is done by a rabbi who is an expert in this. I'll explain why in a moment. What you do is you arrange, you authorize a rabbi to sell it for you in the right way. So what you do with the rabbi, let's say Rabbi Alex or with me, you go to them, you are not selling your chametz, you are appointing him or me or whichever rabbi you're using to be your agent to sell it for you. The sale only happens on the morning before Pesach, Arab Pesach. What you're doing with that document, I'm going to look at that document in a minute, is you are authorizing me or Rabbi Alex to sell the chametz for you. Now that is our current method of selling chametz. It only goes back about 200 years that we're selling chametz in this form. And we avoid the problems that I mentioned before in the following manner. Number one, we know he's going to buy it back. Okay. However, What a sale needs in Jewish commercial law is two things. An action that defines the moment of the transfer of assets plus gemiras das. There has to be a meeting of the minds. I want to sell it and you want to buy it. So the way we achieve that in Jewish law is by an action called a kinyan. A kinyan is some action. Each class of objects has another type of action associated with it. Another action that creates this legal sale, and it is a full sale. So let's just say the non-Jewish person um, 
one of the one of the methods is a barter. So the non-Jewish person gives me something, let's say a pen, and I give that person back something, all of the chametz that we're trying to sell to them. So even if later I come to the non-Jewish person and I say, I want to buy it back from you, that doesn't interfere with the fact that the sale was a complete sale because it was done in full accordance with Jewish law and with secular law. It's a full sale. And that means that when the chametz is sold, it doesn't belong to you. Even if you know that later on you're going to buy it back, it doesn't belong to you. So, if for some reason, let's say the non-Jewish person would come to your house and say, you know, I bought your chametz, I, I need it, I want to take it, you're required to let him in, make a list of what he takes, and he's going to pay you the balance of the fair market value of it. Now, there's a lot of dispute over which kinyan, which action is valid for this kind of a sale. And because of that, we're very, very careful. And so when the rabbi sells the chametz to the non-Jew on Arab Pesach morning, we actually do eight different sales, eight different mechanisms, meaning all for the same sale, eight different kinyanim, to make sure if any one is not correct, the other one is correct. It's done in a very careful manner using all of the laws of Jewish civil law as well as secular civil law. Okay? So it's a valid sale. Even if it's going to be returned later, bought back later, it's a valid sale while it exists. That's number one. Number two, the fact that the food stays in your home, what you're doing is you are leasing the space to the non-Jewish person where the chametz is resting. So the part of your home where the chametz is, let's just say it's in a closet, that closet floor does not belong to you. You leased to the non-Jew, along with buying the chametz on top of it, you leased the floor underneath it. If, for example, the non-Jew would come and say, uh, I don't want to take any food, but I need to store something, and I know that there's a cabinet and, I, and, and I'm leasing that cabinet, so I get to use that cabinet, and I want to put my stuff there. You have to let him. So therefore, the chametz is not on your property. Yes, it is inside the four walls of your house or your car, or your business, but it's not your property. It's somebody else's property. And that's why you're required to tape it off, to mark it off, so that you know, don't go in there, because number one, the food inside that cabinet doesn't belong to you. And number two, you're not allowed to use the space inside that cabinet. Number three, in terms of the payment, here's what we do. We say to the non-Jewish person, <clears throat> If you would ask us how much the value is, we don't know. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to ask you to pay us a down payment. And later, after Pesach, you'll have two choices. Either we can buy it back from you and we will return the down payment. Or you can hold on to the sale and then we will set up a panel of independent evaluators who will go through all of your stuff, all of my stuff, and evaluate it. So I have some bottles of whiskey that are full. That's kind of easy to evaluate. What's, this, what's the market value at the SAQ? I've got half a box of Cheerios. Okay, how much is that worth? I have some... Uh, 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 a, a little bit of crackers. I've got some uh, uh, some uh, some pasta in the in the freezer. So how much is that worth? I don't know how much it's worth. So we'll have independent professional evaluators, and they'll go from home to home. I have no problem if a non-Jewish person wants to buy the stuff in my house, and he's going to pay me full market value. I'm fine with that. I, that's what I'm agreeing to. 
if he decides that he wants to keep it. Otherwise, he'll simply say, I don't need it. I'm happy to sell it back to you after Pesach. But we insist that the sale takes place immediately. That is, not like a down payment where a layaway plan where only when I finish paying for it does it belong to me. The down payment completes the transaction. It belongs to the non-Jewish person immediately right away. And this is why you need to arrange with a rabbi who really is an expert in these laws to make sure that it is done correctly, that it's made sure that it's done legally, both according to Jewish law and according to civil law. A lot of people say, I hear people say, it's just a joke. It's a legal fiction. So, I have to say that um, I strongly disagree with that. First of all, for my whole career, I'm the person that arranges the sale to the non-Jew. To me, it is very serious and very valid. And uh, it's not really a legal fiction because it uses legitimate legal means to remove chametz from my ownership. The prohibition is ownership. It's a legal concept, right? What is being prohibited according to the Torah is a legal concept of ownership. And therefore, we use existing legal forms to take away that ownership. And it makes perfect sense. I mentioned this before briefly, but let me just uh, um, emphasize this. There are two different documents involved. There's the document that you will see, which is really called the harsha'a. That is when you appoint a rabbi, like Rabbi Alex or me, to sell the chametz for you. That's not a sale. That's just an appointment of an agent for us to work on your behalf. Then there's a separate document that is the actual contract that we use between ourselves and the non-Jewish person. That is the actual sale document. I want to just take a moment to review this document. So, first of all, uh, it, the, the sale of chametz form that we send out, first of all, it's on our website, it's in our emails. Also, um, our bulletin is coming out, I think today or tomorrow, and it's there. And uh, so, le let me just clarify a few points that are in this document that you would fill out. So, um, we suggest uh, if you have chametz and Pesach is coming, give it to the non-Jewish needy, and we can help you with that. Or you can fill out this form and you can ask, name Rabbi Alex to ask as your agent. Of course, one agent can appoint another agent. So if you appoint Rabbi Alex, Rabbi Alex appoints me and I'm the one that does the actual sale. Rabbi Alex is usually there. During the week that it is sold, it does not belong to you. And so anything that is sold has to be closed off, taped off, so that you remember it doesn't belong to you. And also, as I said, the property on which the chamed sits also is leased to the non-Jew, and therefore it doesn't belong to you either. You can't use it either. We ask on the form where you're going to be during Pesach. So as long as you're in the same time zone as us, there's no issue. But if you travel outside of the time zone, then there's an issue because... There's a certain time that we sell the chametz, and there's a certain time that we buy it back. Now, there's a difference of opinion. If I own chametz in Montreal, but I happen to be located for Pesach in Israel, well, according to whose hours do I sell chametz? Do I sell it according to the hours in Israel where I am, or in Montreal where my chametz is? So we follow the opinion of Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, who says it's where the person is. And therefore, if you are far away in another um, uh, time zone, we cannot sell the chametz for you. Because if you're in Israel, by the time we sell chametz, which is in the morning before Pesach, you have already been owning the chametz. It's already early afternoon, and you were not allowed to own that chametz during that time. You have to get rid of it in the morning by about uh, 11 a.m. So our sale would not have been valid for you. And furthermore, 
when we buy chametz back at the end of Pesach, for you in Israel, that's not going to be till the morning. So that means you're not allowed to use any of your chametz until the next morning. And then it happens in opposite if you go to the West, let's say if you go to California. So we say is as follows. We say it is preferable that if you're going to be out of your time zone, out of our time zone, you should arrange the sale with a rabbi in the time zone where you will be. If you're going to be in Israel for the Har Pesach, arrange it with a rabbi in Israel. California, California. However, we do say, if you want us to take care of it, well, we're happy to take care of it. We know a rabbi in, in, in Israel. We know a rabbi in California. If you would like for us to take care of that, we're happy to arrange it for you. But just understand, we won't be doing it. It will be done by a rabbi in the place where you are, according to the hours of where you are. It's necessary for this contract to be valid that you sign it and also that your spouse sign it if that's applicable and also adult children if that is applicable. And uh, we give some examples of what chametz is made from barley, oats, wheat, rye, or spelt. We do not sell kitneos. A person is allowed to own kitneos even for the Ashkenazim that do not eat it. So we do not include that in the sale. We also do not include the sale utensils. Even if there's a little food stuck to the utensil, we do not include that in the sale because if that were to happen, then um, then the utensils now would have to go back to the mikvah after Pesach. So we don't sell the utensils. Turns out, with the sale of chametz, that a large part of the preparation for Pesach is commerce. It's buying and selling. At first glance, it seems quite extraneous to Pesach, especially the details of a kinyan, a payment of a contract, abiding by civil law. How does that fit in thematically with Exodus, with redemption, with leaving Egypt? So I heard this idea from Rabbi David Feldman a number of years ago. Because by selling chametz, we create an added prohibition if we were, God forbid, to eat it. If we were, God forbid, to eat chametz in our house on Pesach, not only would we have violated the serious sin of chametz on Pesach, we also would have violated the sin of stealing because it doesn't belong to us. We sold it. And therefore, our sages decided thematically that to keep us from eating chametz, the threat of kares, the terrible spiritual sin, is not enough. It has to also have an isrk zela. Oh, to take something that's stolen, that I would never do. Even if I'm not so careful about the ritual laws, but to steal something that belongs to someone else, that's, that's something I could, never, I could never bring myself to do. And this shows that the observance of Yashris, of being an honest person, is intrinsic to Yahadus, to being a Jewish person. And that quality of Yashris, of honesty and straightforwardness, is necessary for Geula, for redemption. So when you fill out the form this year, and you go to Rabbi Alex or to me, you should think about the statement that you're making about being careful in monetary issues, guarding against taking what is not yours. This represents the magnificent evolution in Jewish practice to include this theme and to show its relevance to freedom and redemption. My friends, I wish you a great day and I look forward to seeing you soon in person.